Essays? Proverbs? What was the question? <laughs> the, the, the question, the question has, let, has left the, the gate already. You can't bring the question back. <laughs> now we're talking about wisdom literature. There is a, there is a, uh, a select set of books that are in the Old Testament that are known as the, as the wisdom literature, but don't, don't be fooled into thinking or don't, lead that, don't let that lead you into thinking that that's where you find biblical wisdom, that what you find elsewhere in the, in the Old Testament or in the New Testament is something else, right? Maybe stories or fables or poetry or who knows what. But uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, wisdom, the Bible drips with wisdom uh, from the very uh, first page. And it continues not only through the Old Testament, but especially in the New Testament as well. Because what we, what we see personified in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament and particularly in Proverbs, we, uh, we read about uh, wisdom personified uh, as if she were a person in the feminine, uh, as if she were a person speaking. Uh, in several of the chapters of the book of Proverbs. But what we discover when we take a closer look at it is that it can't be anybody other than Christ. Not just who personifies wisdom, but who is uh, living wisdom, right? And so we thank the Lord for that. So the, the subject of my topic or my, my thought today is, is how to be wise. How to be wise because if, if there's something we need in this world I would argue is uh, how to be wise so let's move on to the next one after all we live in a world that is that is suffering from lack of wisdom would you agree with me I mean just take a look at some of those I think I could have uh, probably multiplied multiplied that page 20 times over particularly in light of the of the uh, of this crazy mentality that has gripped our country and notice that I put it down th down there at the bottom and what of the United States of America uh, we're becoming foolish in so many many ways did your parents let me just just throw an idea out here did your parents or would you recommend to your children that they should be up to their up to their ears in debt would that be a good thing? Would that be a good thing that 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 your that your children should have to hock their lives and the lives of their of their offspring down the road to pay for a debt that they probably could never pay? We we know that that is utterly stupid and ridiculous, right? And yet, where do we find ourselves as a country? Anybody know? what the national debt is for the United States today? Anybody have any idea? 32 trillion? Uh, I think it's 32. I think it's 32 trillion. I could be off by a couple of trillion or one way or the other, but I think it's 32 trillion. I hate looking at that clock that every second is just adding to the debt more and more and more and more. Can you imagine? I think somebody has calculated that if that debt were to be divided among all the citizens of this country, each one of us would have a debt somewhere in the neighborhood of $90,000. So you owe, if you're a citizen of the United States, you owe $90,000 apart from every other debt or every other, you know, a situation that you might find yourself in. If that isn't alarming, then something is. And I'm old enough to remember uh, back when the idea of even being in debt to the tune of two or three billion dollars was inconceivable. That this country could be in debt for a billion dollars, it was, it was almost impossible to imagine. And today we're in debt to the tune of 32 trillion. By the way, how much is one trillion? In case you don't know, anybody know? A hundred billion. A million, a thousand billion. A thousand billion is a trillion. So, yeah, I'd say that uh, our political figures 
have not acted wisely. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we could multiply this situation over and over and over again, not just in this country, but around the world. As God left this world to fend for itself, more importantly, as God left uh, us as members of the body of Christ to fend for ourselves, to find wisdom wherever we can find it, to dig a hole and see if we find any wisdom there that might that might help us to to move forward and get a and get a handle on life. Well, you know the answer to that. God is a gracious God who is ready, willing, and able to provide wisdom to every one of us. And it doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter your race or your sex or your. Uh, uh, let's go on to the next one. It doesn't matter your your social or political situation, whatever it might be, none of those things have anything to do with what it takes to possess wisdom from a biblical perspective. I imagine you can probably buy a book today. You can go to Barnes and Noble, Nobles, and uh, you can pick up all kinds of books that'll that'll tell you how to be street wise or how to be wise or smart in your economic dealings and this and that. But I'd like us to consider what the Bible has to say about wisdom in general today. Okay? Because I think we'll discover something uh, pretty interesting. By the way, if you have a question, feel free to ask it. I'll try to answer it uh, if I can. But let me just go on the record and say that from a biblical perspective, None of these things here, not your intellect, not your education, not your instinct, fame, fortune, your material accomplishments, not your political standing or position, none of those things in and of themselves guarantee that you have wisdom. You may very well have it, but it isn't because of these things. It's because you have something beyond these things. The problem in this world is that we tend to we tend to bequeath wisdom to people who have made a fortune in the financial markets for example we see them as these uh, paragons of industry and knowledge and and we think that they can say or do no wrong but in doing anything like that we're undermining the very biblical concept of what wisdom is okay so thank God that you don't have to be a billionaire to be wise. Amen? Amen. Right? <laughs> thank God that I don't have to drive a uh, Mercedes Benz to be wise. Although I do own a Mercedes Benz uh, chair. No, I own two Mercedes Benz chairs. Well then, I, super status. Does that mean I'm super wise? <laughs> you guys think I'm kidding, but I'm not. Angelo bought me two chairs a while back. And according to him, I haven't seen a mark that says anything, but according to him, he says the brand is Mercedes. Because he hasn't turned it upside down. <laughs> Mercedes Benz. So I do own a couple of Mercedes Benz chairs. I believe it. I trust it. But that, doesn't, that isn't what makes me wise anyway. All right? So where does wisdom come from, right? That's the question to ask. If you're not going to get it because you're famous or rich or any of these things, then where is wisdom uh, from a biblical perspective to be found. Well, let's move on to the next. Well, I mean, this is as simple as uh, as uh, Bible 101, okay? Bible 101. It doesn't come any more simple than this. The faithful, those who study the Word of God, those who, who believe in the Scriptures, they read them and they know that God is the only true source of wisdom. Now, this is one thing I want you to understand. The Bible does not say that true wisdom can be found in all kinds of other places, including God. It's not, it doesn't say you can find wisdom in philosophy or in, uh, in studying history, and you can also find it by seeking after God. It doesn't say that. It basically says if you want to find wisdom, the real deal, the only place where you can find it, is in God himself. 
So Daniel 2.20, And Daniel spoke and said, Let the name of God be blessed from age to aim, for power and wisdom are his. That's an absolute statement, isn't it? What do I mean by absolute? It leaves no room for any other pretenders, right? It doesn't say uh, God uh, for age, for power and wisdom are his, and Plato also has a bunch of it, or <laughs> or Aristotle, or uh, or uh, Dr. Irby Valdez, right? I mean, uh, it's an absolute statement. It comes from God and God alone, right? But not only does it come from God and God alone, the Bible also tells us that if we want it, we have to go to Him, right? And so we have James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, ask it of God, who gives it to all abundantly and without reproach, and it will be given to Him. So here you go. So let me just ask you here, before we move any further, how many of us here today, and I, I include myself in this, how many of us here today, if we were honest with ourselves, we might wish we could go back in time to change an action or a decision we took uh, because ultimately it cost us financially or it hurt our family or it just didn't live up to what it was meant to do. Let me give you a brief illustration. If I had it to do all over again, and I saw an Amway person coming my way, I would run in the other direction. That's true. I would, I would run in the other direction, but I was a little foolish back in the 80s, late 70s when I was in my 20s. And we had people that were friends that were Amway people, and they just filled our thoughts with you can be a diamond and a ruby and a who knows what and a who knows that. Remember, babe? And we, we, we got into that thing, believing that that was God's will for our life. I don't know how much time we spent on doing it. Did we make a penny? We didn't make one penny on Amway. Yes? What's Amway? Huh? What's Amway? Ah, babies. Thank your lucky stars that you don't know what Amway is, okay? You were born here. It's a crazy pyramid. Like your multi level marketing. It's a multi-level marketing system. Uh, I'm not saying it's not a good company. I'm sure it's a good company, but I'll tell you who's making the bucks. It's the Amway company. They're the ones making the bucks. The diamond. And a diamond, <laughs> right, and this and that. Well, here, I've just confessed to you that, that I did not use not only my better judgment, but I, I perhaps I didn't use the Lord's wisdom when, I, uh, when Virginia and I decided to get involved into that. And there's probably a million other things in the world, and I'm not just talking about financial kinds of situations, right? I mean, all of us can probably go back and find uh, a decision that we made that we wished we could make differently. So, God is telling us here, hey, if you lack wisdom, I'll give it to you on my terms. It's here. But you've got to take it on my terms. All right? So let's, uh, let's continue. Well, let's continue first by defining it, because this is important. What do you think wisdom is? Before, before you read that, I know you're going to read it anyway, but before you read it, if I were to put you on the spot right now and ask you, define wisdom for me, how might you define it? Anybody? Knowledge on a specific subject. Knowledge on a specific subject. Okay, I think that's a that's a that's a that's a good start. It cool. fails miserably, but it's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> that seems more like intelligence. I'm sorry. That definition seems more aligned with intelligence. Yeah. Well, inte well, knowledge intelligence is the ability to learn. Knowledge is the actual information learned. Yeah. But yeah, they they kind of go hand in hand. I would agree with you. No, Any other? Yes. yes. Understand to make the right decision on something you're not fully uh, in link with. All right, he already read what I had up there. No, I didn't. <laughs> no, I, didn't. I think wisdom is knowing to do the right thing and not do the bad thing, like Amway. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, really when when you come down, when you come down to the nitty gritty. That's that's basically the biblical biblical definition 
of wisdom. It's a very simple thing. Now Tozer puts it in, a, in an interesting way. He says, wisdom among other things is the ability to set perfect goals and achieve them by the most perfect and effective means. All right, so you set a goal in front of you and you're gonna achieve it in the best way possible. Packer, J.I. Packer, famous, very well-known theologian says, wisdom is the power to choose the best, the highest goal, along with the surest means of achieving it. Do you see what both of these, now both of these guys have read the Bible, so they know they discovered what true wisdom is. True wisdom isn't just knowledge. It isn't just having the mind of an Einstein to know things. And it isn't just having the intellect to be able to amass all this great information. When, it, when we come right down to it, wisdom from a biblical perspective is having the right kind of knowledge so that you make <coughs> right choices. It's goal-oriented. It's aimed at an end, at a result. Okay? So notice my definition down there at the bottom. Uh, wisdom is practical and functional. It's not esoteric. It's not uh, mystical. It's not, uh, uh, it's not complicated, complex, and ethereal or anything like that. It's practical, you can handle it, you can see it in front of you. It's functional, it, it works in this world. Having the best knowledge to take the best actions in keeping with the Spirit's leading and God's moral standard. So it's the ability to make the right choices, to make the right cho choices, which will by definition honor God's moral standard. So if you make a choice that seems to work and yet somehow it violates God's moral standard, from God's perspective, that's not wisdom. That you're acting on your own. Because God never, God never violates the terms upon which he gives wisdom to us. Yes, ma'am. Um, I never thought of wisdom like this, but it kind of sounds like a godly version of ambition. <laughs> A godly version of ambition. Care to elaborate a little more? Like when the Bible says, don't be like ambitious wolves, mm -hmm. um, where they're like self-seeking. Okay. Um, but wisdom seems like it's very ambitious, but seeking God's will. Well, uh, I don't know. Let's yeah, see. except that, that wisdom wisdom isn't, isn't active. Wisdom isn't doing the action, you're doing the, the action because you're wise, because you employ God's wisdom and because you're, you're true to that wisdom, God enables you to understand and to make the right decision. So uh, I don't know if that, if that kind of separates, yeah. separates yeah. one from the other, but yeah. So I would argue that uh, from a biblical perspective, wisdom is, very, is a very simple thing. You don't need to know abstract concepts. You don't need to be a student of systematic theology or any of these other ologies in the world. You just need to be sensitive to God's, to God's prompting as he guides you in his word and then employ that as an action, as a way to to, to take the right action. Yes, sir. Uh, what what are the you mentioned which I see you have like there's a goal in mind there's an objective yeah that you see source but but I also see and I may be wrong but a source here okay. where where they they it says you know wisdom is the power to choose the best highest goal so that to me implies a source it's almost like what is the highest good what is the best good in this case what is the best or highest goal and it seems like it finds its source in God too in other words saying that wisdom is almost the pos the possession of God's thoughts. Uh, the ability to yeah to 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 find that all wisdom eventually finds its way in and, and the reason I'm saying that let me tell you is because I could see somebody who is not a believer I could see somebody stand up and say well Dr Gonzalez uh, I I don't believe in Jesus I don't believe in God but I believe I have wisdom I, you know I believe I make good and wise choices and uh, that nonetheless that they could not see 
that whatever decisions that m most people might agree is a, a practice of wisdom, whether he believes it or not, it still is, is a practice that finds itself rooted in the wisdom of God. So you're, you're extending the possibility that a non-believer could actually exercise wisdom. No, I'm actually, okay. I'm, I'm actually saying that uh, if a, if a non-believer were to claim wisdom, what I would say is whatever, it's almost like, you know, the, the rain lands on both the, the, yeah. the good and the evil yeah. uh, in the same way that people may be able to display elements of wisdom. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if they're not believers, those displays of wisdom if they were to, to chase after it, where did you get it from? Would eventually find it find its source in God. Okay, yeah, I think, uh, there is uh, there is a theology of natural revelation that says that nature itself declares the glory of God, and and some people can can perceive the world around them and somehow say there's got to be a creator. One thing leads to the next, and eventually they find themselves in the presence of of God, right? Uh, then on the other hand there's the there's the view that says creation itself is sufficient only to condemn you never never to lead you to salvation so it's uh it's a it's a question worth exploring i would i would agree yes i think the difference between a non-believer and a believer a non-believer's motives are not right their motives are not right they don't know the mind of god if they're not a believer because they don't have god in them Whereas I think that a believer takes that into consideration and, and God gets the glory. Whereas an unbeliever, your wisdom, wisdom exalts you. Exalts you. Yeah. Okay, That's a so great I point. Have, I have something to ask on what Irby said and what Virginia said. Then explain our judicial system. <laughs> Angelo, we don't have the time to get into our judicial system. I mean, there's judicial. wisdom there. Where do they get their wisdom from? I think there's wisdom in earthly and worldly secular things, like Chinese proverbs. But I think what Irby was kind of like saying is that you can all find the root. It all ties back to being truth and Bible. Mm -hmm. And it's like branches, that branches often seem secular, but truly you can prove a lot of it using <coughs> biblical truth. Yeah, I see the source of wisdom found in God. But like Virginia so well said, the practice of wisdom can only be found in what does God want? What is what is the end goal, like Rudy said about? So, yeah, I think you're exactly right. Angelo, to answer your question very quickly, uh, the framers, the founders of this country, when they wrote the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, they didn't necessarily uh, 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 anchor it in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament. They were led by what is known as as natural, natural revelation. They had a deistic understanding of, of the principles in this world, okay? So in that sense, again, they can find, the world can find certain elements that will work for a while. But how good is our constitution working today? All right? And how many constitutions, by the way, did Mexico have in its history? Anybody know? How many would you think? How many have we had? One. One. We had the Articles of Confederation, and then we came back and wrote the Constitution. So we had two, we had kind of half of one, and then we had the Constitution. How many has Mexico had? <coughs> Go and find out. <laughs> it's been more than one, I can tell you. It's been like a dozen Constitutions from 1821 moving forward. So. Uh, uh, again, wisdom is very practical and functional, and it, it's goal-oriented. It, it, it seeks to, to find the, uh, the way to do the thing that you have to do, which means that if you don't have a challenge, if you don't have an issue, if you don't have anything in front of you that you have to handle and negotiate, and what, what should I do with this? If your life is so perfect, that you have absolutely no challenges in your life, then you have no reason for wisdom either. Because what wisdom does is that it gives you the answer to be, a, it gives you the ability to find the correct answer to be able to navigate the challenges that we find uh, ourselves in this life. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I think 
there's there's the biblical wisdom, mm -hmm. and then we have our earthly definition of wisdom. Yeah. Right. So I would say that the early definition of wisdom is what I had said earlier. Okay. Is is specific knowledge on a specific subject. Mm -hmm. Because wisdom, if if I were to say you're wise, meaning that you have wisdom, it could be on a specific subject, but it's not necessarily goal-oriented, I wouldn't say. If I were to say, give me some of your wisdom, yeah. and you tell me how to stay out of debt, it's not necessarily... But then, but then I am providing you something function. Something I'm not functional, just selling, but, it, but it's not necessarily a goal. Well, no. If you're telling me, hey, help me ha how to get out of debt, that is a goal. So I'm not that I have that kind of knowledge or wisdom, but I would tell you, well, listen, you need to do these three things, and you'll be out of debt in two years or whatever the case might be. That's goal-oriented, right? It isn't just knowledge. Yeah. It's uh, it's goal-oriented. But... Um, uh, it's an interesting topic to explore. So what I want us to do is to continue talking about this. So let's move on to the next. Thank you. So here we go. Genesis 2, understanding what does not lead to wisdom. All right? So uh, we're going to look at the Genesis account of the fall uh, and how it is that it does not lead to wisdom. So let's continue on to the... Oh, go on to the... No, oh, good. he's already ahead of me. <laughs> All right. Uh, so the wrong path to wisdom. See if you agree. All right. We're looking at Genesis 2. You know the story. God commands Adam and Eve, telling them not to eat of this, of this tree. Right? You can eat of any tree in the garden. Verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. That's the that's the key passage for us to consider here today, right? Verse 17. Life is simple back then, isn't it? I mean, it is supremely simple. Not a million commands, one little command. It's perfect. You can do whatever you want to, but do not eat of that tree. That's the that's the one command there. As we continue reading in the text, of course, uh, the serpent, uh, uh, Satan, uh, or Eve encounters the serpent, uh, and the serpent begins to, to tempt Eve. And notice verse 6. Here's where I want us to focus. And the woman saw that the tree was good to eat, and that it was pleasing to the eyes, and a covetable tree to attain wisdom. She said, hmm. This tree might actually provide wisdom for me. I think she maybe thought she didn't have wisdom. She didn't have any access to wisdom. Who knows? But she says, says, this tree can be good to give me wisdom. And she took of its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband who ate uh, as well as she did. Right? And so would you agree with me that both Adam and Eve believed that the way to achieve wisdom was to know both good and evil? Right? Did they know both good and evil prior to this moment? They didn't. All they knew was good. But Eve thinks to herself, I need to know good and evil if I, you know, as a way to gain wisdom. And so she uh, she partakes of the tree, and then her husband goes right along and uh, partakes of it as well. So both of them believe that the way to achieve wisdom was by knowing both good and evil. Let's move on to the next. Brother, can I just yeah. add something real quick there? Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd say that, and of course, I, I'm not saying that's incorrect, that at this point that Eve knows only good because she doesn't know the difference because she's not aware of evil. She, so she has no comparative basis. But that at this point, she only knows God. Okay. In other words, uh, and I kind of kind of going back to what I had said, that I think the previous week, that it's not that God didn't want them to know that was keeping them from knowing good or, or you know, because they say, well, doesn't God want them to know good? Because God is good, right? But that that God says, I want you to know me. If you know me, it's sufficient. And in and, and, and doing that, what it does is say that there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom, which I know that's what you're going to lead to here. Um, but I see... Uh, and maybe, and, Let and me maybe, push back a little bit. If sure, I sure. I hear what you're saying. 
but I'm I'm not sure that I that I that I'm quick to accept that 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 position that she didn't know good. All she knew was God. God, by definition, is good. So right, she knew right. good. She knew good. The other thing that which I think your your idea possibly implies, I could be wrong, but the other thing I think it implies is that since she didn't know good and evil, there was no way for her to act, to act in a wise manner. You see? If if all she knows is God and doesn't really know good, she can't act. She she has no wisdom. She can't act in a wise manner. That's what I think this position that you're articulating here leads to. And I'm going to I'm gonna I'm gonna head it in a little bit different direction. Sure. See if uh, see 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 how yeah, yeah. see if both of us can arrive at, at no, some. This is, uh, this is great because I'm trying to figure out the nakedness here later because I'm you know, working <laughs> on that. So all right, well, this is a PG program, okay? So there, <laughs> there's no nakedness in this uh, in this uh, in this uh, study. Just leave but it up. Maybe just she chalk it up to, to my uh, my upbringing. Huh? <laughs> but maybe she did know how to act because God had already told her. The, well, hold on, Angelo. Yes, okay. well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say that she did. Okay. I just haven't gotten to that yet. Right. Okay. My bad. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to the next. Uh, okay. Uh, so, knowledge of good and evil. We both know. We all know how that turned out for them, right? I mean, it didn't turn out good. It was a it was a a fiasco from the from the very first moment. He believed that the knowledge, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good to eat. Uh, she perceived that it would bring her wisdom, perhaps in her own ignorance, believing she wasn't wise, or she had no access to wisdom. But she thought, hmm, I need to know both in order to, to understand or to, to have true wisdom available to me. Uh, but I would argue that she saw the, the fruit of the tree under deception. That when she thought that way, that when she thought this tree will provide me with wisdom, she was thinking deceptively. She was under the power of deception. Paul says, for example, in 1 Timothy 2, uh, says of Eve, the woman being deceived incurred transgression. So the moment she starts thinking that you need both good and evil to be wise, already your mind is heading in the wrong direction. It's heading in the direction of a corrupted understanding of how it is that God gives evil, uh, gives wisdom to people. If you come to the point where you say in order to, to to truly act with wisdom in the world I have to know both good and evil from a Genesis perspective that's a corrupted way of thinking and it's only going to lead in the in the wrong direction okay so how was she deceived first the tree had its name didn't the knowledge of true and evil so she knew what she was going to get by eating that tree, both good and evil. She already had good, but she was going to add evil to the margin. God had forbidden the eating of that tree, which would result in death. So she had to have known that eating of that tree was not going to end good for her. It was going yeah, to be opposite what God, what God told her that what God... <coughs> had given her. Was she living in a perfect environment? Yes. Did she have access to knowledge of God? Yes. Did she have access to wisdom? She did. She did. Yes. Wow. Not just God. She had access to wisdom. But she didn't know it because Satan managed to corrupt her way of thinking by leading her down the primrose path and telling her that in order to be wise you have to know both good and evil. And on a human scale that makes sense. For example, if I want to if I want to build an airplane, right? 
You can bring me a little book. This, if I want to bring a Boeing, if I want to build a brand new Boeing airplane, you can bring me a little book this size and say, here, this is all you need. Or you can bring me 20 volumes, each one about a foot wide, and say, okay, this is what you need if you really want to, to build an airplane, right? I'd be dumb to take that little book, I mean, if I really wanted to build an airplane, right? So, this is, this is the question. This woman is thinking along those lines. I need more knowledge than just the good in order to know wisdom. And in doing so, uh, she made the wrong choice. Now, let's go on to the next one. The consequence of knowing good and evil. By sinning, Adam and Eve, they, they know now both good and evil, right? Uh, but did it do it any, but did it do them any good? Did it improve their life because now they know both good and evil? Eating the fruit of the tree uh, confused, con <coughs> perverted, deranged their knowledge of good and evil. Eve came to see evil according to God is good and good according to Satan. Okay? So rather than, than having a, a pure undefiled knowledge of the good, she now confuses what Satan perceives as good. What God says is bad, she now perceives it as good. And what God saw as evil as now and now as uh, good, if that makes any sense. Okay, so here we have two evidences of the disruptive effect of knowing both good and evil. After eating the fruit, innocence was lost. Would you agree? Of course, right? Why do we say this child is innocent? Why do we say this child is innocent? Because the child has what? Is not aware of evil in the world yet, right? Now give him three or four days and he'll become aware. But <laughs> as of right, right then and there, this child is living in total innocence. All this baby, all this child knows is, uh, is the good, me. at least at that point. Feed me. Yes, that too. <laughs> so innocence was lost, a state in which man could no longer be trusted uh, to enjoy life and do the right thing because innocence is lost. Right? And once you lose it, it's like the genie. Once it comes out of the bottle, you can't put it back in there, right? Once innocence is lost, uh, the cat's out of the bag for good. Before, communion with God was good, but after they ate, they sensed their alienation. There's that dreaded uh, N-word, right? And they were driven from the garden, in effect, separated from God. So knowledge of good and evil rather than giving them wisdom is the actual thing that separated them from God. Well, let's continue. So, thank you. There we go. So, Genesis 2 and 3, the result of knowing good and evil, perverted knowledge. We could find a lot of examples of this uh, in the Bible, but I love that passage in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 where uh, the prophet condemns woe to those who say good to evil and to good evil, who make light darkness and darkness light, which make bitter sweet and sweet and sweet bitter. By the way, is he just speaking, is he just speaking about one person or is uh, Isaiah speaking globally? <coughs> He's speaking globally, right? He's speaking about a, a human tendency uh, to want to pervert the knowledge of the good and turn it around. Let's move on to the next. Whoops. So, was it bad for Eve to want to be wise? I would say no. I would say no. Because God, by the way, I didn't want, I didn't mean to put damn there. <laughs> I forgot the A. <laughs> All right. All right. 
God wanted Adam, not them, wanted Adam and Eve to be wise about good, but ignorant with respect to evil. Okay? Notice what Paul says in Romans 16, 19. But I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Okay? Wise as serpents, innocent as doves. Yes, there you go. Yeah. So, but but guys, let me just ask a question. Isn't the, isn't there a branch of popular opinion out there that says that in order for you to truly be wise in this world, you have to know the good, the bad, and the good. You have to have done this and that. You have to have, quote unquote live. You have you you need to have uh, experienced all the crud that is out there in order for you to truly know how to avoid the pitfall. By the way, what threw you into that pitfall to begin with, right? But in order to avoid those pitfalls and to uh, and to live a life ultimately meaningful. Isn't that kind of a popular mentality today? Do we find that happening in the world today? And I think, uh, I think it's repeated over and over again, over and over again in our, in our culture. But let's be honest. A knowledge of evil generally tends to pervert the good, right? Have you, do you ever find regularly that a knowledge of the good I mean, out there in the world, I'm not talking about someone in Christ, but just out there in the world, that knowing the good is going to sanitize the evil. Usually it's the other way around, isn't it? It's the other way around. <coughs> so people generally look for excuses or look for ways to justify what is wrong. They're never looking for ways to justify what is right. If you're doing what is right, what justification for it do you need? It's right on its own terms. But whenever you're doing something that you shouldn't, then you're looking for some kind of uh, justification. So does the Bible offer an alternative to thinking that both a knowledge of good and evil are necessary to attain wisdom? And I would argue that it does. Let's move on to the next. First of all, let me get a little water here. You see, here's where Here's where Eve messed up, and Adam too. They lived in a world uh, clothed, to use the clothing analogy. They lived in a world clothed with wisdom. Look at what Psalm 104 says. Oh Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth, the, the earth is full of your possessions. Or Proverbs 3, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth and by understanding he established the heavens. Or look at Proverbs 8, the Lord possessed me. Here's that proverb I was telling you about uh, where wisdom is personified. The Lord God possessed me wisdom at the beginning of his way before his works of old. From everlasting I was established. Notice what it says there in verse 30. Then I was beside him as a master workman, which means that the creation of God had the fingerprint of a wise creator. You could see the, you could see the wisdom of the creation if you had eyes to perceive it and to see it. All right? Any carpenters here? Anybody do, do, do a little bit of carpentry? Could you look around here and look at the way this building is constructed and and know one way or the other if this construct if this building was constructed right or if it was constructed on the cheap or on the fly or haphazardly i think you could right if i had constructed this uh, this room you could definitely tell that the guy who built this room was not a was not a, a carpenter right well, that's what, that's what the Lord is saying here about wisdom. It manifests itself through his creation. I was his, day, I was his daily delight. And notice this, and having my delight in the sons of men. So that what we have here is that creation reveals God's wisdom, being a delight to both God and man through mutual understanding. 
God didn't leave Eve and Adam in the in ignorance. He put them in a world that was framed in wisdom and gave them eternity to study it, to understand it, to comprehend it, to to come to grow in wisdom and in knowledge. But they looked around themselves and said, God is denying us wisdom because what we need is evil to be able to understand <coughs> wisdom rather than recognizing that the wisdom was all around. Yes. So, brother, would you say that, that one of the fundamental problems with Eve's mistake was that she confused or misunderstood the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Yeah, the problem is, is we just don't have enough information in Genesis to know that one way or another. But notice the word understanding is there as well. It isn't just wisdom. It isn't just wisdom as if it jumps at you and all of a sudden there you have it. There, it's a two-way street. Wisdom is there, but understanding needs to flow from you so that you understand what is there and you come to understand what wisdom is teaching you or how wisdom wisdom teaches you. So I would say that it was a two-way street. Let's go on to the next. But here it comes, it comes down to this, guys. Uh, in the very beginning, with Adam and Eve, the wisest thing that they could have done because they had their life eternity ahead of them to do everything else. But the wisest thing that they could have done from the very beginning was what? Obey God. Obey God. Stay away from that tree. You stay away from that tree and you have all eternity to investigate and discern and learn and, and grow in wisdom and in stature. Who knows what they would be today if they had never disobeyed. But it comes down to obedience. Did Adam and Eve want to be wise? They could have been if they had obeyed. Look at Deuteronomy 4. So keep and do them, talking about his commandments. For that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is wise and understanding people. If you will just live in obedience to what I require of you, then people will see that you're a wise person and an understanding person. And they'll bear witness to the fact that you are, that you have this, this inner wisdom. Look at Psalm 111. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. So, biblical wisdom is to be found in the natural order, also in scripture, I believe, uh, but it, it, isn't, it doesn't really become yours until you're actually willing to obey it or live by it because then you come to understand its true uh, value. So see if you agree with my statement here. We obey God not because we are inherently wise. We don't obey God because we're wise. When we trust Him, his general wisdom revealed to us by his creation and his special wisdom given in his commandments, the Bible, show us how to walk in obedience, thus making us wise. So when we walk in obedience, then as we continue to walk in that obedience, our wisdom, our biblical uh, wisdom grows. Let's go on to the next. I love this passage in Proverbs. Wisdom, the true tree of life and happiness. Right in verse 7. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. You see that? Do the good. If you want to be wise, don't, don't, don't have a knowledge of good and evil. Turn away from evil. But then look at verse uh, 13. How blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her profit, talking about wisdom, her profit is better than the profit of silver and her gain is better than that of fine gold. Notice in verse 18, talking about this wisdom, 
uh, Proverbs says she is a tree of life. So the tree of life is no longer in the Garden of Eden, but all of us, if we walk in the knowledge of God's ways for us, we have access to the, to the true tree of life. Okay? Any questions about that? Let me look at one more. So, how does that how does that uh, uh, what do you, what, are you, what do I want to say? How does that uh, partner up with uh, human wisdom, right? Well, the Bible understands that there is false wisdom which was which must be rejected. James chapter three: Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds, and in the gentleness of wisdom. Notice. Wisdom is action-oriented. Show by his good behavior. Wisdom is not just knowledge. It's not just understanding. It's not just uh, having an encyclopedic knowledge of a certain subject. <laughs> it comes down to, to uh, does, it, does, it, does it help you to, to live the kind of life that brings honor and glory to the Lord. And if it does, then you're manifesting wisdom. Notice what he says in verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So there you have it. There's uh, about as good uh, a description of wisdom as you can find in scripture look at what Paul says about wisdom in 2nd Corinthians 1 for this is our glory this is the Christians glory that we can recite the Bible from from first page to last not necessarily that you give a million dollars to the church every other week not necessarily that uh, you know you've been to seminary or university or whatever not necessarily notice 2nd Corinthians 1 12 for this is our <coughs> glory the testimony of our conscience with with simplicity and sincerity of God this is our glory not with human wisdom but with the grace of God we have conducted ourselves in the world and much more with you so what is our glory the fact that we have wisdom, yes, but not just wisdom per se. Not with human wisdom, but with the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world. Again, it's action-oriented. Our glory is that the wisdom that God gives us makes us makes us walk in a way that is that that is that is more consistent with God's ways and brings ultimate glory to the Lord. Yes. I Can I read something? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, second, uh, first Corinthians 2, it says, now we, have now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, ultimately, uh, uh, Christian wisdom, biblical wisdom, if you want to put it that way, uh, is, is given to us through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Let's go on to the next one, some practical lessons. First Thessalonians, examine everything, hold fast to good, and abstain from every kind of evil, right? So the believer must be discriminating, discriminating in what he or she embraces. That's common sense, right? Beware of folk wisdom. I mean, you turn on television and immediately, who's there telling you, who's there telling you uh, <laughs> what you need to believe? The five, the five wise ladies of Hollywood, right? Uh, be careful, be careful. Uh, my wife. I told my wife she needed to quit watching that show. I'm kidding. <laughs> she doesn't watch it. She doesn't. 
uh, Beware of Folk Wisdom, Winfrey, Dr. Phil, so many others. They, it's not that they have wrong ideas. Sometimes a lot of what they have makes sense and can be practically good. It, it's, it's in that they also can combine it with other philosophies and ideas so that it's hard to, <coughs> to uh, uh, disengage one thing from the other. Uh, treat secular counseling therapies with caution. Don't be quick to baptize them with religious terminology. Make sure that the approach has a biblical foundation. There are a lot of, there are a lot of insights in the world of psychology, sociology, you know, the, the various behavioral sciences that can bring understanding to the human condition. But we need to find a way to ground those ideas in scripture before we just pick them up. Uh, so be careful to examine all things and retain that which is good. Ultimately, apply that which does not <coughs> violate God's commandments as far as God has given you understanding. If there's any if, ands, or doubts in your mind, if there's any doubt and you wonder, should I say this? Should I go down this road? Then uh, the better part of wisdom is to know, is to, is to say no, to don't go down that road. Don't go down that road unless you are fully assured. Reject any thought or action that is clear violation of God's will as expressed in his word. And uh, let's remember, go on to the next one. So let's remember that true wisdom is always Trinitarian. I say that unapologetically. What have I been saying from start to finish? From start to finish? Here I said that wisdom comes from who? The big G, right? <laughs> God. Well, are we monotheists? Yes, we're monotheists, but we're also tri triune. What theists. is a monotheist? We believe in only one God. Okay. Okay. Notice how Paul puts it right here. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, diligent be, therefore, I'm sorry, see therefore diligently how you walk. So he's talking again about actions. He's talking about behaviors, right? Not as fools, but as wise men. And how is it that you walk in wisdom? Well, you're filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, singing and praising the Lord in your heart giving thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, does he leave anybody out? No. Does wisdom say you can function wisely and leave the Holy Spirit out of it? Can you leave Christ out of it? Can you leave our Heavenly Father out of it? No, you can't. It requires all three because all three are the are the Godhead. We worship the triune God. We don't just worship Christ. We don't just worship the Father or the Holy Spirit for that matter. So somehow <laughs> or another we need to check. We need to have the discernment to, 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 to be able to have a connection with all three members of the Godhead whenever we're deciding to act a certain way. Okay, so let's go on to the last passage, and I am finished for tonight. And it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 through 25. I was a little worried that Angelo was going to read this passage, but he I did. Can. I got it right here. I got it right here. I love, I love the way Jesus, I love the way Paul puts it right here. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age. Now notice, he's being sarcastic, isn't he? Notice, where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? What, is a, what does a scribe do? A scribe writes. A scribe was a learned person. Bring me the most learned person that you can. Where is the debater of this age? Bring me the person with the greatest rhetorical skills. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to, they, to save those who believe. 
For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Amen. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen. So I make no apologies. Amen. I make no apologies. The Bible may not tell me how to, uh, how to build an airplane, but it can give me the wisdom necessary for me to be efficient and effective in learning what I need to learn to be able to build that airplane. You see, the Bible may not tell me the first thing about how to be a, a jockey, you know, at the, you know, at the Kentucky Derby. But if I'm a Christian jockey, I can gain from Scripture, from my knowledge of God and Scripture and the world around me, perhaps the discernment necessary to know how to handle that horse more effectively. Wisdom works in all facets of life and ultimately it isn't just what we know it's putting to work what we know to attain the best possible choice the best possible outcome in keeping with God's moral standards which is to say to bring God honor and glory <coughs> to the Lord Amen. so you have the good the better and the superlative the greatest right and I guess we kind of live in that world, right? The good, the better, or the best. We want to aim for the best. We don't always achieve the best, but that's our goal. That's what we want in life. All right. Well, uh, just one. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, any questions or comments? Yes, sir. You know, uh, that, that's a fantastic study, and it's a reminder. Uh, I think that so oftentimes we need a, we really need to evaluate our just the way we do things. A lot of times we may carry habits or notions that we haven't really, like you said, put to the fire in light of God's word and say, is this is this truly wisdom that I'm doing here or there uh, according to what the world says? Because so often the world goes in the opposite direction. I mean, I'm thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of Daniel. I mean, how many people would have thought it would have been wise? Wisdom would have been, hey, whenever they say kneel, you need to kneel. You don't need to upset the system and I think that so many times we're in, we're just uh, drenched in this world system yeah that so many times we have to be careful with just the little things that we do that may be yeah. that may be uh, uh, that be in God's eyes now the world may say oh that's wisdom there may yeah. actually be a lack of wisdom because we may actually compromise to some degree or yeah just because so many people around us are doing it so of course that also challenges us to be careful who we surround because if we set, surround ourselves with fools Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just a matter of time that that's going to have a negative effect. Yeah. I mean, all of this is, uh, in some sense, I admit and I confess that it sounds lofty. I mean, when you come down to it, how is it that by observing nature, I'm going to be a better accountant or a, or a better student or this or that? Well, it wasn't long ago, it was two or three weeks ago, Irby brought us a study on eagles, mm -hmm. right? Did we learn anything from an eagle? I did, I learned some things about an eagle there, that, that and that's nature, that's creation. Uh, and so, can I learn something from the ant? The book of Proverbs seems to think I can. Mm -hmm. Can I learn something from, from rabbits and from, uh, you know, uh, this and that of course we can all learn from everything around us because it all has God's fingerprint and if it has God's fingerprint then it's it, it was built with wisdom and we can learn something from that it may not it may not be applicable today but six months from now you're gonna find yourself in a situation and you're gonna say man I remember when I thought about this, and here's a place where I can put it to work, right here and right now. So, I hope that encourages you. We all have a, a, an encyclopedia of knowledge all around us, 
God's knowledge, God's wisdom for us to use for his honor and glory. Amen. Okay, Irby, you want to wrap it up? Sure. Thank you, sir. Well, let's uh, close in prayer. Stay here with me, brother. Okay. We'll close in prayer. You know, I'm telling you, people would pay money. <laughs> that kind of, I mean, really, he's been a, he's been, well, I don't have pay. Um, <laughs> but uh, I want to say Rudy has been a blessing to me, uh, how much he shared his wisdom. And, you know, that's another thing. If you possess wisdom, you're foolish if you don't share it. That's part and parcel to wisdom. And so parents, you have kids, share your wisdom with your children. Um, spouses, share your wisdom with your spouses. My wife blesses me with her wisdom all the time. And I've found that usually if I listen to her, I'm usually acting wise. And so uh, let's, that's, part of the, uh, that's part of the gospel. Uh, the, the part of the gospel cause to share the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So let's go to the Lord. Lord Father, I thank you for my brother Rudy. And I just thank you for his faithfulness and blessing us with the reminder, Lord Father, of the wisdom that we find in you and your presence. And a reminder, Lord Father, that it's not uh, it's not an abstract thought. It's not an inert word, but a, a, a living and active call to be obedient to you, Lord Father. Let us let us uh, act out our wisdom, Lord Father, by by uh, holding holding true and fast to your wisdom, to your words, and to trust in you and our faith. We thank you, Lord, for this study, and we pray that you be with us for this remainder of the week. May you. Bless the children as they are um, uh, closing out their year. May you bless them in the summer. And just uh, pray that uh, as we transition into the, the, to the summer months, Lord Father, that we uh, uh, continue to, to keep our eyes on you. I thank you for this evening and all that was entailed. In Jesus' name.